Good evening. It is six o'clock. It is Wednesday, the 15th of March. This is the 15th March uh, school committee meeting. And we will, this meeting is being recorded live by SCTV um, and will be on channel 14. And we'll begin as always with the Pledge of Allegiance. Next up is our per first public forum of the evening. Uh, anyone who wishes to speak needs to be signed in. Uh, we'll have three minutes to speak and ask that it uh, be addressing issues that are pertinent to the uh, purview of the school committee. Do we have anybody like to speak at public forum? Anybody else like to speak at public forum? Okay, moving on. Next up is the student representative report. I did get a note that uh, Ms. Jenna Lodge could not be here tonight. So we're just cranking through the agenda already. Uh, next up is the superintendent's update. Uh, Dr. Mruschek. Thank you, good evening everybody. Uh, just a few things, uh, a few updates to um, share with you. First off, some really, really great news within the last couple of weeks. We received word from Nikki Bordelone, our uh, district nursing coordinator, that we received a competitive grant for the amount of $30,000 from the Massachusetts DPH through a program called the Comprehensive School Health Services Grant. And um, the primary focus for these funds, and, and this hopefully, um, will be a recurring grant um, is to kind of upgrade a lot of equipment and also services that our school nurse teachers provide to students every day. 
Um, and I put in the background notes some of the um, services and equipment that'll be used with that 30,000. And I think one of the most noteworthy things is upgrading our AEDs. Um, we made a purchase earlier in this year for six brand new AEDs. Um, we will be doubling that to 12 with the calculus, ensuring that we have one on each floor of our buildings, plus a little extra uh, at the middle high school, particularly you know for athletics and so on. So I think that's uh, really, really significant. I think uh, the, the plans are also to upgrade some of the software systems, some of the software that's used to better monitor our students who have type 1 diabetes. Um, other thing uh, that is really, really important is professional development so that our nurses uh, maintain their licensure, not only their licensure through DESE, but their RN licenses and they have appropriate CEUs and so on. So uh, hats off to Nikki. I think it's a great news and uh, commendable that she went after this competitive grant and we earned it. So I know she and the nursing team is really, really excited about it. Uh, the second piece I have this evening is just to kind of do a check-in. We've talked a lot about the various facility projects. So I'd like to talk about um, just kind of a quick follow-up on where we are post, I, I refer to it as the restoration, but kind of dealing with some of that water damage that we had at both Forestdale and uh, Oak Ridge. Uh, Chris Dentino was good enough to take these pictures this afternoon around 3 or 4 o'clock. Um, the work that's really going on at Forestdale right now is, as we discussed before, um, the construction crews from Service Master are reattaching some of the drywall um, with joint compound and then doing a paint job. Um, this year, uh, this week rather, the second floor should be completed. The next week, they're going to do the affected classrooms in the first floor. Um, by the end of this week, we should have all of the suspended ceilings replaced, which is great. Um, and then one of the big issues that we still have to, con to come to consensus on and kind of work with our insurance company is the issue of flooring. Um, Chris, I think I can comfortably say that you and the staff would much rather have the laminate flooring versus the carpet tiles. Right now, the difference is about 10,000 to replace those nine classrooms. Um, so I know Chris George is kind of going back and forth with the insurance company. But the game plan would be let's get our kids back in there. They've sanitized and shampooed the carpets. Um, with targeting April vacation and then in June to replace that carpeting. Um, and then I know Chris has started the process of ordering some of the equipment and materials. And, you know, again, think kindergarten classrooms, think of the wooden cubbies and so on that are there. Um, you know, because the bottoms got wet, you know, we want to replace those. And so that'll be tended to. Where are the kids now? So the kids are in temporary locations in other classrooms. So we moved a kid's Bert to like specialist classrooms, like the music classroom or the art classroom. We've got two second grade classes in the multi-purpose room. Uh, one classroom still in the library, correct? You two classrooms. Multi-purpose is the cafeteria, right? It's the other side of the cafeteria uh, with the sliding wall. Okay, so there's. The wall separates them from the rest of the cafeteria? Correct, yeah. They're not like in the open as kids are getting their lunches, yeah. Um, the stage side. <laughs> yeah. The side that has the stage. So um, I think I've said before that the, the staff has been outstanding. The kids have been terrific. And I think in the beginning, it's definitely a bit of an adventure and everybody can make the best of it. Like many things in life, it gets old. So we're eager. Uh, good news with regard to the construction, um, and I know Chris George is definitely happy about this. Our insurance company is paying everything to Service Master directly, so we don't have to get involved in procurement and so on. On the issue of the $10,000, is the insurance company 
not on board with that? Uh, it's an ongoing negotiation, Bert. Okay. A and the, the adjuster was initially like, well, you know, it's, or it's a replacement for a replacement. And oh, by the way, your carpet is 30 years old and, and so on. Um, so I think it's an ongoing negotiation between the insurance company, Chris, and also getting different uh, bids from different. But he's vendors. made it clear he'd much rather have the, um, the laminate. Absolutely. So not even close. I have to uh, uh, respect that. Yeah. I just had a question with the laminate flooring. Um, if you can just keep in mind that if there are teachers down the road like that want to put row rugs or, or sure. things like that in the classroom, that helps with the acoustics tremendously. Um, I know when my son was at Forestdale, we had um, an educational advocate from Boston Children's come, and they do an acoustic evaluation. And the carpeting does help buffer uh, the plank flooring absolutely after what happened. But sure. just don't prohibit teachers from having throw carpets and whatnot. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, okay, okay, perfect. Good for morning morning meeting. Is yes. They like to come <laughs> on the rug and sit down and do their... Yeah, yeah okay, and, and, and realize Thank the you. overwhelming majority of our elementary classrooms also have a very large meeting rug, okay. classroom rug, and so okay. on. Yeah, that's good. So kind of um, looking at the debt exclusion projects, and if I had to have a overall theme with respect to this, it would be um, the simple fact that, um, oh, it, be, before I jump to that, I, I would be remiss to um, realize the work that was involved at Forestdale versus Oak Ridge is tremendously more. So really the only damage was a, a small section of the Oak Ridge Library and uh, the game plan is that section of drywall that was taken out of the Oak Ridge uh, Library will be replaced once uh, all of the operations at Forestdale are complete. So the intent uh, is hopefully to complete everything by the conclusion of this month. So um, just quickly talking about the debt exclusion projects. And, and again, if there's one theme that I really want to impress upon everybody, Chris George is trying to move as aggressively as possible on all of these projects. If you recall during the whole conversation last spring, there, you know, these projects were supposed to be fanned out over a three to five year period. With the rapid escalation of costs of materials and labor, Chris wants to get moving on all these quickly. So he's working very carefully with Gale Associates. Um, if you recall, the roof project at the middle high school is that section of the roof um, over the pool that desperately needs repair. Gale Associates has uh, the design specs at 95% right now. They're estimating that project to be approximately $1.1 million as far as the bond expense. And their game plan is to actually go out to bid for that project next week. Okay. Uh, the Forestdale and Oak Ridge building envelope repairs. Uh, again, significant progress made where uh, Gale has this at 90% design specs. Um, within the last two to three weeks, they've done something known as test cuts where they've actually taken portions of the envelope, you know, the flashing and the roof to see the extent of where there's been damage or penetration of uh, the elements. And uh, the plan is to go out to bid by uh, next month, thinking about at some point in the summer or early fall to commence those repair works, projects. Uh, we've got real significant progress, and this has been one of the two priority projects, the Forestdale and Oak Ridge Playground replacement. Um, and I know I've reported out about this, that the designs uh, are complete, and all of the playground equipment has been ordered. We're anticipating that it will arrive on scene in April. 
uh, working with Pomeroy and Gale Associates, we've procured Childscapes, a firm out of Marshfield that does a lot of this type of work to do the demolition and actual construction of the project, including uh, the drainage design for the moved um, playground at Forestdale. Uh, and if all goes to plan, we're talking about four to six weeks of construction and the targeted completion will be early June. So we're kind of thinking about that Memorial Day weekend or slightly afterwards. What is, what is, the, what is the base, the flooring? What is that made of? It's a mix. Um, it, we, it, it's that um, kind of hard rubberized surface, okay. then also some I'm chips. I'm familiar with that. Yep. It almost feels like you're walking on sponges. Exactly. And, and, and just, uh, you know, if you look at the old, uh, it's actually in the picture there, um, the technology and the materials has just evolved so tremendously. Um, so, uh, you know, definitely will be safe for our kids. Are they going to have any of those speakers or things where they talk talking? Because they never work. They never work. Have you been playing with those, Bert? <laughs> I've, I've been at the three or four schools, and the kids, they never work. During recess duty. Yeah. Yes. Hopefully they will. Um, then we have the uh, Forestdale and Oak Ridge uh, HVAC project, and these are the actual unit ventilators that are in the attic of the schools that go directly into the classrooms. Um, so on Friday, we'll actually have the opening of the bid for the classroom and library ventilation units. Um, Gale Associate is specking this out to be roughly, and this is a big ticket item, 1.9 million for each school, for every classroom, with uh, approximately 933,000 for both the Forestdale and Oak Ridge libraries. So the whole bid package is estimated, if you were to take those costs and add them up, about 5.2 million with an additional half a million in contingency for about 5.7 million. So uh, again, plan is to commence the replacement of this material. However, Chris shares with me, Chris George shares with me, one of the big sticking point is the availability of materials. And I say that uh, with the other project, the HVAC rooftop units. And by design, we have uh, the replacement of three of these units. Um, and we, a week ago today, the bids came back. I should actually say bid came back because we only had one bidder on it. And uh, for the replacement of those three units, it came back at $1.2 million which is uh, about a half a million over our estimation. Uh, Chris has shared with me one of the issues, again, is he's being told that the lead time on these units is about 40 to 48 weeks, so almost a full year um, in getting this in place. And he said, you know, as a result, you're getting this escalation where bidders are thinking about, oh my God, where am I gonna be at the end of 2024 or whatever with regard to labor costs and materials? So there's a high escalation. And then last but not least, um, the relocation of central office. Um, I'm sure you've seen all of the attention over, uh, very exciting, the Center for Active Living is now up and running and operational as of Monday. So as of last Friday, finally, the Human Resources Building is completely vacant. Um, our awarded contractor, CJM Construction, and our project manager, Pomeroy Associates, are on site. Um, they anticipate by the end of this week starting the interior demolition of the building. Um, I'm told by everybody in the know it's a pretty straightforward job. There are some challenges with regard to mechanical and electrical, um, but the game plan is, uh, and, and Pomeroy worked this out with CJM, that our certificate of com uh, occupancy should be complete by uh, November 1st is the game plan. So I know that's a lot, and hopefully that's just kind of the 64,000 square foot view, um, but 
that's where we are on all of those projects. <laughs> Other than the <clears throat> HVAC unit, which you mentioned, came in over our original estimate, how are the other bids? Are we in line? I don't have the, the old spreadsheet in front of me that listed everything you know, for the 15 million. Are, we, are our predictions from a year ago on target? Or are we We're on target within the buffer of the contingency. With the, exception One, of that with the exception of that, and I think I put this in the background note, the good news is, and honestly, I just learned this this week, um, in the prior budgeting process, 1.7 million was, uh, was allocated or earmarked from ESSER 3 for HVAC upgrades. So um, I know Michelle Austin is not, and Chris are not stressing over that disparity of a half a million for the, um, the, the, the single bid for the HVAC roof units at the high school. Any other questions on that? It's a lot moving, moving along nicely. Oh, and last but not least, uh, school councils. Kevin had asked for an update uh, on where we are with regard to school councils and um, it, it, it kind of, this, this is a conversation that's gonna come up a little bit later in the agenda. I think it's just kind of, when you are going through the process of doing policy review, um, doing policy review, you come upon all these policies, what is there, probably easily 300 policies in the entire manual, and I know one of the first ones that we're considering is around school councils. So, um, I, I, would, I, I would characterize that our three school school councils are in different stages. Um, I think they all exist and they all understand their chief mission around um, things like student handbook approval, um, uh, development of goals and school improvement plans, and then also um, advi an advisory role around just the school-wide budget. So as I say in the background notes, um, Forestdale, Chris has a functioning uh, committee as far as the staff, but needs to do an all call with regard to parent and community representatives. I know Trish also has a group of parents and community and teachers, and she kind of runs two separate committees and melds their work together just based upon when parents can meet versus staff. And I know um, Jim has uh, had one meeting in October, um, but has a calendar of meetings scheduled March through June, thinking about the middle high school school improvement plan and also the student handbook. So that's where they are as far as all three committees. Um, I, I've asked the principals to kind of do an all call as far as to find additional parents or community uh, uh, representatives. I, I, I think, as you know, at times it can be a challenge seeing that we have so many other committees and other important work, um, but having a, a viable, high-functioning school council is extremely important. I asked, as I was going through the policy manual, all these things that catch your eye, and um, I compared it against the, we have our existing policy, then the, the, the kind of um, recommended mask policy is a little bit different, and it, and it talks about kind of an increased meeting frequency and things like that. So that's not our current policy, but it's something when we get to the policy subcommittee that eventually will be looked at. And I think it complements, it's required, but it certainly complements your goals or what you determined in your assessment um, that communication is key. And having served on high school council several times over the years. I just think it's so useful to be in that room with teachers, administrators, and students and community people kind of hearing response to similar issues. It's Absolutely. Very helpful. And, and I also feel, and, and I had this conversation with our principals, I do feel like there's a lot of untapped people mm -hmm. within our community, particularly people who might be their, their kids are long retired. I know there's plenty of, of folks that might be retired educators. I'm very close friends with a gentleman. He was a superintendent in the community next door to me. 
Uh, he's the was the superintendent of Blackstone Millville, who lives off Chase Road now. He would love an opportunity along those lines. So um, I think we've got to do a little bit more digging, so to speak. And just to clarify, you know, we have our policy, but if you trace that policy, it goes back to, to Mass General Law, where it says that this isn't a nice to have, it's a shall. We're supposed to have it. So, okay. Anything else? Seeing none. Moving on to new business. Forestdale and Oak Ridge Library books to be discarded. So you have before you a list um, that's been put forward by our principals uh, for both Forestdale and Oak Ridge of uh, books. I think overwhelmingly you'll find that these books are in really, really tough shape uh, due to wear and tear. In some cases, there's actually mold and mildew, or there is uh, torn bindings and so on. So, uh, you know, per our policy uh, around library resources, uh, this is being presented for consideration uh, to discard these books through the typical weeding process. Any questions? So last time this came up, we had talked about um, the getting the support of teachers or educators beyond a paraprofessional to re make these recommendations and has Correct. that been got, gone through that process? Yeah, so um, as I believe, uh, Christine, as I put in the background notes, at, in the case of Oak Ridge, uh, a group uh, spearheaded by Trish, but also uh, one of our reading uh, teachers and also the literacy coach also uh, perused that list and vetted it, so to speak. Thank you. Just one question, and I recognized a lot of titles that go back. Your old favorite, The Attack of the Zombies? Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't question any of that, but I was just curious because a couple that I recognized and I would consider classics were on the Forestdale list and just wondering if there are other fresher copies in the library. Uh, Ezra Keats, The Snowy Day, and uh, The Giving Tree. So good, thank you. <laughs> if not, I have a brand new fresh copy in my office that I'd be more than willing to donate. Just to add to that, I, I, I appreciate the level of detail on the, on the um, Oak Ridge list from Katie that just kind of indicated what, what the issue is with, you know, why it's being discarded. So thank you for that. Any other questions? I'll entertain a motion. I move to uh, accept the list of books to be uh, deleted or weeded from the libraries at the Oak Ridge and Forestdale schools as presented. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes 5 0. And we're off to the races. <laughs> Next up is the discussion of potential playground dedication. So if I could just. Um provide a little bit commentary. Um, I, I put in the packet um, something that literally was posted maybe around two o'clock this afternoon. It'll be appearing in Friday's um, Sandwich Enterprise. And it is a column uh, by a community member, Candy Thompson. And she and I had an opportunity to talk, I think it was just on Monday morning. Um, about a notion around um, paying tribute to uh, the late John Nelson uh, for the playgrounds, you know, and, and kind of naming or memorializing the, the playground project in his memory, particularly in the light of the work that he did um, in the development of the debt exclusion project and um, presenting and you know, the rationale and so on. So um, 
I think it would be, I agree, uh, that it would be a fitting tribute. However, as I, I share with you, um, we do have distinct policy within the district that kind of speaks to the dedication of anything that is considered to be a school facility or on school grounds, um, where there's a whole process um, that I would say is pretty deliberative that uh, would have to be brought forward by a community member. There would have to be demonstration of community support for that idea. Um, it would go first and foremost through the policy subcommittee for consideration with a recommendation to the full school committee and then a kind of wait period, so to speak, of six months of deliberation before it would actually go forward. So I just share those pieces uh, for your consideration. Questions, comments, yes. Yep, thanks. Um, I just, I was looking back at the facilities projects tonight that are undergoing and I thought of John. He had his finger on every single one of these in his five-year strategic plan, um, capital improvement plan. And I agree, we don't get this opportunity often. Um, as many of you know, John passed away suddenly last year, got sick in July, passed away end of September. Um, but he really, he worked really hard, diligently, on getting this, all of these projects passed at town meeting. The playground projects, he showed up at almost all of the playground project meetings. Uh, he answered everyone's questions, and I really feel like his pr presentation at town meeting was the catalyst that got the, the capital plan passed without little to no objection. As nervous as he was, and I think one of our members said he hit it out of the park. Um, but he did a great job, and he cared about our community. And you know, he left behind three kids, a newborn daughter that he maybe got to meet once. And I just think this would be a nice tribute. We don't often get the chance to do this, to memorialize something or dedicate something where he had such a big part in, in getting passed and making it happen. So I wanted to see if we could make a formal request to the um, the subcommittee on policy for the April 2nd meeting, if we could review that um, section F1 on dedicating school facilities. And, and I feel confident we have all of the criteria noted in that section. Um, community support, um, the playground project, um, one of the moms, Antonio Salitra, she's reached out and said that they would help fundraise any type of plaque or memorial for him. Um, as long as some, as well as some other community members. So um, I think now's the time I, and it would mean so much to his family. So I don't know if we can make a formal request to the subcommittee for April. Just, so. we don't have any time limitation on a dedication. And the only reason I bring that up is that because a generation will go by people won't know who John Nelson is. Uh, and it brings to mind, not, and I'm not objecting to the dedication, mm -hmm. um, but it brings to mind when the high school was built in, I don't know what it was, 1976. I don't know how many people in this town recall that the auditorium was the Carl Piler Auditorium. I haven't heard it referred to as such in probably 40 years. So perhaps the committee, the policy committee could consider not just one plaque, but over time an opportunity for it to be added to mm -hmm. because there have been, in addition to John, the groundswell of community support for this mm -hmm. project has been huge. And so, in addition to John, who lovingly and caringly put so much effort into this, there have been a lot of heroes and champions for this project, just to consider, yeah. not to take away from. Yeah. And we have dedication. three playgrounds that we could dedicate to, but it, I think he, deser he deserves, and his family, I mean, this would, um, his kids could be, you know, experience something that their dad had his hands on, that he was part of this project, you know, that it goes a long way. 
Yeah, I do think it, it, it warrants reviewing the policy. This is the very first part of the dedication of school facilities policy says that in honoring individuals, the Sandwich School Committee strongly recommends the establishment of memorial scholarships. And I don't know, Sue, if that is behind that is because that has more longevity or stays on beyond that and also goes further to recommend that we would only consider names with educational significance or inspiration, which is pretty vague, but again, to try to understand the intent of that. So I think it's something that we need to, to talk about and consider more um, and find some way to honor John 100%, just in a way that is consistent with. Um, there are others that will come along right. to truly champion and go beyond, above and beyond, either from the community or within the community of the district. Um, anything else? The, it certainly can be a topic on the policy subcommittee um, meeting for April. Um, I do need, you know, um, I concur with everything that's being said. I do, th I do think there is, um, you know, the policy talks about, you know, there's a waiting period. And I, and I do think that is important in the fact that, um, just from a process standpoint, whatever we do, like I know uh, school was, was changed in my town when I was a little kid. The name was changed. Well, that's still, that's still the name of the school. You know, for, too many years later, 45 years later, if you will. So it, this is something that will last and it, just, it should be um, uh, with due respect for John, but also due respect for the process. It needs to be a deliberate process and not too quick for lack of a better term. I probably said that inartfully and forgive me if I did so. Um, certainly, um, we would not be where we are on some of these projects without John, God rest his soul. So please don't take any of my comments being negative towards us. I just think it needs to be a deliberate process as outlined. Um, but certainly we can talk about it in April. Any other questions, comments? Moving on, speaking of the policy subcommittee, old business, subcommittee updates. Um, I went to a basketball game instead, for, so I missed the last meeting. Mike's not here, so I defer to Christine. Well, <laughs> so I have nothing prepared, but just to give an update, so the policy subcommittee has met three times. That first time we met, we brought a policy to you to update the mask policy, um, um, consistent with what we're doing right now, the, the MASK policy, sorry, not the MASK. Yeah. Um, since then, we reviewed, done kind of an initial and secondary review of policies A, uh, policy sections A through D. So it, there are quite a few changes in there. We're kind of looking at them from a three um, target approach. One is kind of clerical, any clerical changes or uh, spelling, and punctuation, capitalization, mechanics, grammar, et cetera. One is from kind of consistency what's with what's in existence right now with the Mass Association of School Committee's recommended policies, um, as, law, as well as things consistent with current Mass General Law. And then the last piece is really to look and make sure they reflect the needs and the values of our sandwich community and school. Um, so our goal at the last meeting was we have a few that, there's a big section actually, the, almost the entirety or maybe the entirety of section D has been updated um, and it's extensive. So we have a lot more review of that to do. But I think our goal was, and Joe, tell me if I'm, right on this, I think for the a, for a meeting in April, we were going to try to bring the first batch. So as opposed to bringing you a policy and saying, this one has too many spaces between these words and it's missing a comma, <laughs> to give you a batch of clerical changes and then to, to give you several at a time to consider. Yeah, if, you, if you've ever noticed our policy manual, it's separated by a kind of binders. They're labeled A through L. Um, our goal is to get through all of the A, B, and C binders to present on a whole as far as kind of like a vetted and updated uh, three binders worth of policies. And then going forward to put together a kind of a schedule of regularly going through and, and updating all of them. So the goal will be to make sure that we're reviewing every single policy in a section, indicating that it's been reviewed even if it hasn't been changed as of 2023, and then 
kind of to establish going forward. A lot of them haven't been updated since 2018. Um, so there's a lot of changes that we need to go through. And just to clarify, um, MASK has these kind of like recommended templates. It's not required that we use their templates. Sometimes it does reflect the most, the latest MASH general law and things like that. So there is advantage to, you know, comparing, contrasting um, some of that. But, um, and just for those at home, like the, the manual's that thick um, and it, you know, there's a lot of things in there that deserve a fresh look. Mm -hmm. There's no agenda here other than to make sure that we are current with MASH general law and that um, the policies reflect our, the way we want to, we either do operate or want to operate. Um, one I will mention that probably we need maybe a little legal counsel on eventually. I know we didn't think we we're going to use all the. There was a recent, uh, I'm not sure it was a district court, state supreme court, whatever it was, uh, ruling about public comment. Um, I think it was shared with everybody just for awareness. Um, you know, and I, I kind of chuckled because I had looked at our existing public comment. I looked at the mask one, I kind of merged them, added a couple thoughts I had, and this ruling basically blows it out of the water. It basically says public comment is that, it's, it's the it's speaker's corner for a lack of a better term, if I can use a uh, go across the pond where anybody can get up and pretty much say whatever they want as long as they're not inciting violence from a First, from a first Amendment standpoint. So um, I know the email I got on the, from the, the listserv uh, on that, Everyone's tr trying to digest what the, it was actually first mentioned at the select board of selectmen's meeting and everyone's trying to t digest what it really means and how we um, ensure compliance with res with res you know respecting uh, people's right to speak but also ensuring decorum um, but it would be, be interesting to see what Joe has to say on it Joe not this Joe but Joe our lawyer um, uh, you know and I think everyone's probably still chewing on it but just everybody's here's awareness and everybody at the table's awareness that's out there. Yes, Bert. It was also mentioned that you don't have to have a public forum. That's true. So. Um, we, yeah, it's, at, it's harder if we, ha but, if, but if we elect to have one, um, those are the rules we have to abide by. And just like we, we traditionally have two, um, and I personally, I, I kind of like that. Um, I mean, you know, there might be certain nights we don't want to have it, but that's really not the, that's not the way we should ever operate. Um, I think because we may talk about something during a meeting that someone wants to speak to at the end, and I think there's validity in that. But that is something the policy subcommittee can discuss too and bring it forward for the whole committee's represent, uh, consideration. That one's probably worth waiting till, you know, after May 4th, um, because the, the next committee is gonna have to deal with it. But that's just my personal thoughts. Any other comments? No, I, I, I think to your point, Kevin, I'm sure very, very shortly we'll see legal briefs from both MASC and MASS regarding some of these thorny issues. Yeah. Um, to the point when I even said I would ask, I even said I, I would ask that you keep it within the purview of the school committee. I, I can't require it as the chair or as the acting chair, excuse me. So with that, yes, sir. Uh, you, you mentioned keeping it within the within the, the public comments, keeping them to what's on the, um, thank you. This, you'll get all someday <laughs> uh, on the agenda. And the comment today was not on the agenda, was not on the agenda. So and can, can you, does it, is that just a recommendation? Based on that, the way I, you know, I, I didn't go to law school, um, but the, the basic read of that opinion was provided they're not um, doing anything that is unlawful or inciting violence, they can speak about whatever they want to. Our current policy does say it has to be on the agenda, but I don't think past practice has shown that, true. We, that we have followed that. In fact, the, the recommendation I was going to bring forth um, was that it be under the purview. Because, um, you know, uh, Dave Sampson came to us one night and talked to us about the pool, which was a very valid, it's within our purview, it's a valid concern. Just because it wasn't on the agenda doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to speak to it. Personal opinion. That said, this ruling is much more expansive. Um, you know, uh, was that the was that the article where this woman was shut down from speaking, or it was? It's actually from a board of selectmen issue. Uh, okay. Somebody, it, I forget what town. Doesn't not that it matters, but Southboro. Um, and you know, it 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 devolved, and the and the the person who was basically shut down by this, the board of selectmen sued him 
on First Amendment grounds, First Amendment grounds and won. You know, won right. Yeah. You know, I don't know. It, it's the moral victory, and, and you change you change the policy. But we'll just have to deal with that as we go forward. Any other comments? Just the free speech is a biggie in the Constitution. Yes, ma'am. And we, if we choose to do public forum or to maintain public forum, then we are inviting comment from the public, which we say <coughs> we want to have. So if we, we, we're not deliberating now because the issue per se was not on the agenda, but as of policy and principle, how are we going to know what folks are thinking if they don't Okay. Tell us, and our policy now says that the committee does not engage in discussion about it, but we'll hear it. Right. So that's a good thing. No, I agree. I, 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 I agree. That's why I like having uh, the beginning and the end, to be honest with you. Um, any other comments? Moving on to acknowledgments. Bert, can you make sure that. Has that red folder gone that way and back? Okay, great. Sorry. Ms. Menenda. Hi. Um, I wanted to acknowledge all of the families at Forestdale and Oak Ridge that have, have donated items for the basket raffle and ice cream social tomorrow night. There's over 65 baskets that you can um, put your raffle in for. It's a great event. It's um, tomorrow night at the high school from um, 5 until 8. They'll start pulling names, pulling numbers at 7 o'clock, so don't come at 7.30 because you'll miss the boat. But um, just a tremendous outpouring, and I've seen pictures of the baskets. They are phenomenal. Of different themes from sports teams to Patriots to Legos to Nerf. It's a great, it's a fun event for the kids, and um, I just wanted to comment that it's amazing, 65 baskets. So, thanks. Anyone else? Okay, I got a couple. Uh, stand by. Um, I had a couple. First off, what's that? Uh, a tip of the cap to James Murray, Ben DiGiacomo, and Dylan McCabe for going to the States for DECA. That, I think that's fantastic. Um, also, uh, uh, congratulations to both the girls' hockey team and the girls' basketball teams, which had good, excellent seasons. Unfortunately, their, their season is complete. They've uh, uh, bowed out of the tournament. But uh, our boys' hockey team will be going to the state finals at the Garden um, this coming Sunday at 3 p.m., uh, there's actually games, I think, all day long and in one ticket. You have to get, go online through the MIAA. I think it's actually through Ticketmaster, believe it or not, to get the ticket. Uh, the tic Ticketmaster probably has a monopoly of the garden. I don't know. I think it's 14 bucks. Uh, there is a, for students, not for us, but there is a fan bus. Um, that is, uh, kids need to go to the front office at uh, Sandwich Middle High School to sign up. I think it's $5 to... Yep. Um, I can tell you that's the cheapest bus to Boston you'll ever find. Um, but uh, best of luck to the boys. Um, and I do it periodically, but uh, I'm going to do it one last time because the season is now complete. I just want to thank the facility staff um, for the great support for Sandwich Youth Basketball going back to November 7th when the season started. Um, we finished up uh, our last practices for the travel teams last Friday. Um, for those doing the, the math at home, that's 18 weeks. Um, so uh, they were fantastic. It's specifically, I do not have all the names, and I, and I so sort of fail on me. When we did our Marsh Madness tournament about a week and a half ago, it was actually we started the night after our last meeting. I walked into Oak Ridge Gym, and the far basket was fully raised. I've been walking to that gym for a decade. I've never seen it raised. Uh, and the motor was burned out. And we had a team from Carver walking in to start a tournament in which we had no room in the inn as far as flex. Um, I, and I went up there on a whim. I wasn't even supposed to go up. Um, short story, endless. Um, they were the, the facilities team was already working. I gave Chris call, Chris George a quick call only because I had um, Joe made a mistake of giving me his number. Um, on the fly, uh, he opened up wing for us so we could shift a couple games to wing because uh, we were running games at five thirty, six thirty, seven thirty, eight thirty. Um, it was a bit of a scramble, but on their way out to wing pickup truck with the lift machine to get up and fix that basket was there. They had it fixed in about an hour uh, and we were back in business. And um, those, were, those were staff that had already gone home for the day that when they heard we were in a pinch, uh, they immediately turned around. They didn't do it for Chris, they didn't do it for me, they did it for the kids. And uh, I just wanna say thank you to them all. Uh, I didn't get a chance to 
I was on the phone and juggling a bunch of things, as you might imagine, but uh, they really were came through in the clutch for us when we had a little hiccup, so thanks to them. Anything else? Warren, oh, yes, ma'am. Didn't you finish our list? Oh, okay. Um, it's March, it's mid-March, um, and I just want to shout out to the seniors and their families. Um, the decisions from colleges are starting to come in. Um, there was a wonderful article in the Boston Globe magazine a couple of weeks ago that really focused on it's a really exciting time, but it's also a challenging time for young people and their families if, in fact, students don't get the news that they're hoping for. And so any way we can just recognize the effort uh, and what that takes, that academic and co-curricular achievement of a four-year college career is something to be appreciated and just shout out to all those young people and their families who are engaged with applications to service academies, to work, to the service, whatever. This is a stressful time. And the parents who are looking at that FAFSA application. Um, next, anything, any uh, last alibis? Warrants. I we move to do, do we have the, reg the, the oh. do we have four signatures? We do not have four signatures. Do we have four signatures now? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. We do. I'm going to be okay. legal. I move to approve the warrants as signed uh, by a majority of the school committee. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Motion is second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? That was a one and only, I guess. Okay. It passes 401. Okay. Next up, uh, act on the meeting minutes of the regular business meeting dated March 1st, 2023. Move to approve the minutes of March 1st, 2023. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes 5-0. Moving on. PTA, PTSA, Special Education PAC, School Council, Board of Selectmen Report. Oh, yeah, I have something for the CPAC, Special Ed Parent Advisory Council. Um, they're finalizing to have a meeting on Tuesday, April 4th, uh, 6.30 start time, at um, hopefully at the Oak Ridge Library. We're nailing that down. Um, it's a general meeting and open to anybody that with a child that receives special ed services, IEPs, 504s. Um, and we're going to have an educational advocate, Gretchen Arvinatopoulos, is going to be present to answer anybody's questions. Um, she can talk about anything from transitioning to IEPs. So that's Tuesday, April 4th, 6.30. Okay. Anyone else? Liaison Advisory Committee reports. Uh, I'll, I'll just mention the Safety and Security Committee continues to meet and, and actually make, I think, really good progress. Um, we've, uh, at the last meeting I was remote, so I only heard about 60, I heard everything close to Joe, everything on the far side of the room was hard to hear. Um, but we did, the, the group did it, uh, approve a new app, correct? Or my Both a new app uh, for not only kind of a panic button, but also a pretty comprehensive app around reunification. So I'm sure we'll do a presentation plus uh, those interior door locks that go into uh, the floor. Um, I've rapidly learned that across our district, we have 603 doors, <laughs> uh, more than I thought. Um, so we're in the process of getting that up and running. And then our next meeting, not to steal your thunder, Kevin, but we're meeting again on the 23rd. And a couple days ago, we did finally get our safety vulnerability threat assessment report from Act for Safety. So we'll be reviewing that. That, that committee has a renewed vigor uh, and is getting things done, which is great to see. So thank you. Anybody else? Other topics not reasonably anticipated by the chair? I have none. We, it brings us to our second public forum. Would anybody like to speak at public forum? I would have been disappointed if Mr. Holden didn't come forward.
We trust you. Charlie Holden, 35 Lakeview Drive. Um, I'd like to agree that the safety committee's been doing a, a fine job, progress, which is uh, important in that area. Um, the, uh, the crews that, uh, I was at Forestdale School the morning after the big freeze, and uh, I met up with uh, Mr. George quite by accident. Uh, a lot was going on then. Uh, everyone has done such a fine job. Uh, the, uh, the faculty, the staff, uh, the contractors, of course, it's such a great thing that they're close to being back in full service. And uh, as always, Dr. Joe, I appreciate your reports. Thanks very much. Oh, gosh, how could I forget this one? Uh, let's go nights on Sunday. There you go. <laughs> Anyone else for public forum? Announcements, closing remarks. Ms. Brown. Um, just two upcoming events that I wanted to get the word out there about. One, Sandwich Soul is having a concert this Friday night at 7 o'clock um, at the high school. $10 for students, $12 for adults. It is the show choir, Sandwich Soul, in concert, come sail away with us. All funds go towards the show choir tour. <coughs> then... Sorry, let me find the other one. Um, the upcoming show of Knight's Theater Company is Les Miserables, and they are performing soon, April, the weekends of April 7th, 8th, 14th, 15th, and 16th um, at the high school. Students and seniors, $12, adults, 18, and I'm not sure about tickets in advance, but two amazing shows coming up. Anyone else? Just to embarrass her, happy birthday to my daughter. Tomorrow she turns 15. I think it's it's just I'm glad you bring up that point Susan because this is not just a sandwich phenomenon but it's universal the uh, the number of cases of type 1 diabetes has skyrocketed and particularly with younger younger diagnosis and younger kids so one of the challenges that's come back to me is the challenge around particularly when a student is younger and they're newly diagnosed is keeping them stable and monitoring them. So I think that piece around having better strategies around monitoring the kids and the better technology so that you can keep them stable throughout the day is one of the largest challenges. Seeing no more. Uh, next up is adjournment. I'll, I'll entertain a motion. I move that we adjourn tonight's meeting, um, March 15th, 2023, and we'll meet again on Wednesday, March 29th at 6 o'clock. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Passes unanimously. We are adjourned. Thank you very much for coming. Have a good night. <laughs>